They say, well, you know, there's everybody has a God. Everybody worships by different names. Uh, but it's all the same God. Back years ago, there was a course being taught at Marshall University on world philosophical literature. And the whole premise of the course was we're all going up the same mountain, just different sides. And that's been prevalent even since I've been here in our town of Lindale. I've had some folks who've been church members for a long time, maybe since they were children, who made mention to me that, well, you know, it don't matter what you call God, it's, we're all doing the same thing. We're all going up the same mountain. But folks, that's the question we need to answer for people when they come to us, you know, uh, because even television programs present God or present a belief in a deity enough to get you into heaven. And the devil doesn't care how, how uh, religious you might be just as long as you don't believe the truth. Amen. So what is the truth? And that's what we find in John chapter 14 and verse number 6. Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you're my age, and some of you are, you remember a TV program years ago, I remember seeing it even in black and white, called To Tell the Truth. Do you remember that TV program? So some of you are as old as I am. But on that TV program, for our young people that maybe never have seen it, on that TV program, three people would claim to be the same identical person. And they would try to convince a panel of three that they were really the person that was being, uh, being placed before the panel, that they were the one that did the deed, or they were the one that was known for that particular aspect. And so the panel would ask them questions to try to weed out who was the real person. Now, interestingly enough, as I went back and studied a little bit about uh, this particular program back when it first came out, the winner, the panelist that, won, that actually named the person the real person and got it right, won some cash. But the losing panel members that didn't get it right actually uh, uh, were given a year's supply of rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. <laughs> I thought that was funny. So they, you know, a consolation prize was rice aroni. Well, what would it be great? I thought if God would appear on a on a show like that, so that once and for all we could conclusively find out which God is the real deal. Put three panelists up there, all claiming to be God, and be able to find out which one was real. Now this morning we're going to struggle with that question: which God? is real. And it's imperative, I think, that we answer this question because if we get it wrong, there is no consolation prize. There is no rice aroni. You get this wrong, you don't have heaven and you will spend time in hell. So if some of you had been asked the question, which God is a real God? And you may, if you haven't already, by those who have nothing to do with church or maybe family members who don't know what to believe, but if you're asked that question, uh, you need to have the answer, and you need to know what the answer is. In fact, uh, I remember speaking to a college professor several years ago who pointed me, uh, pointed, point blank told me that all religions led to God. That was his statement. I can remember just being down the road visiting in a home here in town with a fellow that had been a part of our church and other churches for years, who told me that it didn't matter what you believe about God. All you had to do was believe that there was a God. So evidently, our churches are not teaching what they need to teach, and people are not learning what they need to learn, because this is a very important question. He believed, this, this professor believed, that you simply needed faith in one of those belief systems, didn't matter which one, and you're going to be all right in the end. Now, that kind of thinking is called pluralism. Pluralism. Now you say, what is pluralism, brother folks? That pluralism is the belief that all religions lead to God. No matter what you call your religion, it doesn't matter what you name your church, it doesn't matter what book you read as a Bible, it only matters that you have faith in a religious system. 
pluralism. It makes us feel good to be able to affirm that we belong to something. But the question is, is what you believe true? Is what you believe true? I've said it before. So many people will go to hell by 18 inches, the distance between the brain and the heart. They have certain knowledge, but it's not part of their heart. Well, let me share with you, first of all, the problem with pluralism. If God reveals himself in the path to heaven in all religions, then we got a big problem. If God reveals himself in all religions, we've got a big problem. They're so vastly different that it calls into question God's character. Let me show you what I mean. In Eastern religions, such as Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, they believe in impersonal deity or pantheism. Pantheism means all things or everything is God. And there's no concept in Eastern religions of an afterlife. On the other hand, Hinduism believes in an impersonal deity, and polytheism. Poly means many, or, or many gods. So they have many gods in their system, and they believe also in reincarnation rather than an eternal heaven. Then there's Islam. Islam believes in an impersonal deity. They are monotheistic, meaning one god, but they believe that eternal life is something that you have to earn. It's not something that's done for you. It's something you have to do. Then comes Judaism. Judaism believes in an impersonal deity, monotheism. And again, just like Hinduism, they believe that eternal life is earned. Then comes Christianity. And in Christianity, we believe in a personal deity. We believe that he exists. We believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We believe in one God manifesting himself in three persons. But the big difference is we believe that eternal life is not something that has to be earned. Eternal life is a gift. It is a gift given to us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So if God reveals himself through all the world religions then we're left with two options concerning the character of God. What are they? If pluralism is true, then God is either a liar or he's schizophrenic. If you believe that every God is okay just as long as you believe in God, then you have pluralism, and pluralism means that God is either a liar or he's schizophrenic. The difference is, are too deep to, con to conclude that all religions lead us to the same destiny. Now, I suspect that people who support this kind of a view have really never examined what the Bible has to say about God and about salvation. They don't know what the Bible says. They just believe that all you need to be is religious. I've had people say, it doesn't matter what church you go to, just as long as you go to church. Yes, it does. Amen. Yes, it does. Because not every church is teaching the truth. And not every preacher is preaching the truth. Folks, listen. The differences are too deep not to know what is true. A God who would devise a polytheistic or pluralistic uh, belief system uh, is, as I said, either a liar or schizophrenic. He's a liar telling one group this is the way and another group telling that's the way. He's schizophrenic. Folks, listen. He has a multiple personality disorder if there's not one way that leads to salvation. One day, he's Shiva, who is the destroyer. Another day, he's Brahma, who is an impersonal force invading the universe. The God you believe in depends on the one you bump into that day. You bump into one, you can believe in that. Bump into another, then you follow that path. If he's a liar or schizophrenic, he's not God, and he's not worthy of trusting and following. Because God says there is but one way, and we're learning about it today. Now, fortunately, you don't have to choose between two options. Aren't you glad? You don't have to choose between uh, this belief system or that belief system. There's only one who, who, who claim to be exclusively God. 
There's only one. Jesus Christ answers the identity question. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus made some very exclusive claims in our text today. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways, or I'm an occasional way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what does that tell us? Well, first of all, it tells us that he provides for us the path to God. We want to know God. We want to be with God. He provides the path. Now, I want to make this statement. I want you to listen carefully. There are as many paths to Jesus as there are people in the world. But there's only one path to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. So he says he is the path to God. Now, in other words, if you want to come to God, Jesus said, you have to go through me. I'm going to back up. Our text was chapter 14, verse 6. I want to go forward to verse 8 and 9 because he takes this same statement a little bit further. And he says, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Now notice what Jesus said. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet ye hast, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me, what? Hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show me the Father? See, Jesus had, had the uh, audacity not just to claim that he was the road to God. He said, I am God. Yeah. Not just the road to God. He said that he was God. He said what, uh, what no devout Jew would have ever said. He said, if you've seen me... You've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It was always blasphemy unless he was really God in human flesh to be able to make that statement. He would have been blasphemous. So we see not only that he provides a path, but we learn that he is God. He is God. Just in, uh, in case that verse that I just read was too vague for you, I want to share with you something else that John records that Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 57 through 59. Notice what Jesus said. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast uh, thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, notice, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus claimed omnipresence. Omnipresence means all present or present everywhere. He claimed omnipresent. And he said that he existed in the past. Before Abraham was, I am. He claimed to be here in the past. And by, by virtue of implication, he's claiming to be here in the future. He said, I was before, I am for, I am here now, I will be here forever. Folks, I am was the name that God used to describe himself in the Old Testament. When Moses said, Lord, who shall I say hath sent me? God said, you tell him, I am hath sent you. I am. And so Jesus said the same thing. They thought that's what Jesus was doing in, in this incident. That's, that's why they picked up stone. They thought Jesus was claiming to be God. And so they picked up stones to throw it at him. Any hint of pluralism, believing that there are multiple gods, any hint of pluralism is, is, is ruled out by these verses. Take a look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Now, you can't, you can't dice that up and make it mean anything else. There is no other name. I don't care what you call God. If it's not Jesus Christ, if it's not God the Father being uh, with Christ bringing you before God, may I say to you, you've never been born again. This was the understanding of the early church. The early church understood this. And it, 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 it's what brought Christ followers 
together and closer. Not only did he provide the path to God, not only is he God, but Jesus is the only means of salvation. There is no other. You can't work it. You can't pray it through. You can't fall out and froth at the mouth. You can't do anything for salvation. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus said. Nicodemus came to him and said, What must I do? Enter my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Skip down to verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, I don't know what evaluation of Jesus you, you've been around. Perhaps some of you uh, uh, have viewed him as a great teacher or, of morality, or maybe just a great religious leader, or one of many paths. He's just one of many paths to God. In Islam, you remember that Muhammad is on the same level as Jesus Christ, a great teacher. And so you may have that view. But Jesus himself claimed to be much more than that. One of my favorite authors wrote one of my favorite books. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. If you don't have that in your library, you should have Mere Christianity. And he said in Mere Christianity... I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said that sort of thing Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says that, that uh, he's, he's, he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him uh, up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and you can call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He's not just a great moral teacher. He is the Son of God. He is the only way to God. He is the only way of salvation. Now, folks, it's very important to understand that pluralism has a problem. It's important to understand that Jesus answers the identity question as to who is God and how we come to God. But in the third place, I want you to see the evidence for exclusiveness of Jesus Christ. Here's the evidence that makes Jesus, knowledge, or our knowledge of Christ, to know that he is exclusively the way to God. Multitudes of people throughout history have claimed to be God, or at least a path to God. Let me give you one example. Back in the 1700s, there was a woman by the name of Jemima uh, Wilkinson, she was born in 1752 to a Quaker family in Rhode Island. She used to tell people that she had died when she was 20 years old, but God had resurrected her. She ended up uh, more than 200 uh, fiercely loyal disciples who believed that she was their ticket to God. She was on the banks of the river one day and announced that she was going to walk across the water just like Jesus did. She turned to her followers and said, Do you believe I can? And they chanted, Yes, yes, yes. And then she said, Well, in that case, there's no need that I actually do it. And she turned and walked back home on dry land. Now, I'm not sure it bolstered the faith of her flock. And it didn't help that she died in 1820. And following her instructions, they didn't bury her because she said she was going to rise from the dead. 
wasn't long before her body slowly dis decomposed and the remainder of her sect dissipated. See, she didn't rise from the dead. She didn't walk on the water. There have been multitudes that have claimed to be God. So, how do we know that God is truly God? Well, let's look first of all at His character. What evidence is there that Jesus wasn't just a big fake? One point is, the, is, is Christ's character. Have you ever noticed that people who look good from a distance get mighty ugly the, 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 the closer you get to them? They look pretty good, but then as you get to know them, they don't look quite so good. They don't sound quite so good. Well, I don't necessarily mean physically, by the way, but the issue of their character. So many times we've been disappointed in preachers. We've been disappointed in Sunday school teachers. We've been disappointed in family members because their character wasn't what we thought they should be. Well, Jesus had an inner circle, people that followed him, people that were with him every single day. So what did his closest friends, those that were with him all the time, 24-7, what did they say about him? Well, let me read what John said. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, John said, You know that He was manifest to take away our sins, and in Him was no sin. John said that. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He said, You know He manifested His character, and His character was He had no sin. Peter, man who gave up all of his fishing, all of his livelihood, and followed the Lord said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, said, He did no sin, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but my friends could never say that about me in good conscience. As a matter of fact, my wife, who knows me best of all, even though she loves me, would be lying through her teeth to say that I was perfect. I keep telling her I am. But she hadn't believed it yet. She still lives in the same house. We were at, uh, at one of the restaurants in town yesterday getting a little breakfast before Terry went over to the hospital. I told the waitress, uh, I said, I'm known to be sweet. I said, just ask anybody. She looked at my wife and I said, just ask anybody else. <laughs> you see, the fact of the matter is, when people stayed with the Lord, they found Him to be flawless in his character. The second thing you can judge him by is his power. His power. Jesus had the ability to do miracles. I'm not even going to compare him to the televangelists who use hidden receivers and gimmicks and stage dramatics and power of, de of delusion. Every miracle Jesus did was, was in and around people. People could see it. People were there. Both skeptics and believers saw him walk on the water. Skeptics and believers saw him change the water to wine, heal the sick, raise Lazarus from the dead after he had been dead for four days. His enemies, if you read the scriptures, his enemies never cast doubt on his power. Not one criticism was on the power of the Lord. Instead, if you read Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out the devils, but by, by Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. They didn't say what he did wasn't true. It wasn't accurate. It wasn't real. They said, oh, he's just doing it by the power of the devil. They tried to discredit him, not what he did. No one ever disproved a single miracle that Jesus did. Believe me, if his enemies could have, they would have, right? If they could have discredited him in any way, they would have. Then you can judge him by his resurrection. Here we are over 2,000 years since the event of the Lord's rising from the dead. And one thing that's a historical fact is that Jesus' body went missing on Easter, uh, Easter morning and it has never been discovered. The Jewish 
religious leaders, the Roman soldiers who guarded the tomb, didn't, didn't stand back and say, well, we know what happened to the body of the Lord. You see, folks, may I say to you, if they could have paraded his corpse through the streets of Jerusalem to prove that he was a fake, they would have done it. Jesus' disciples didn't take the body. They had no clue that he actually had come back from the, the, from the dead to life. All they wanted to do was what? They wanted to hide. They were afraid. If they had managed to get past the elite guard uh, of the Roman Empire and steal the body and hide it and fabricate the whole story, they would have achieved a remarkable thing. But in fact, of those of them, all of them but one died agonizing deaths, refusing to take back the claim that Jesus was not, for he had risen from the dead. Yes, folks, listen, people do die for lies. People do die for false beliefs. But nobody would undergo torture and mutilation and death for somebody who had told them a lie. And then there was his credentials. Before Jesus' birth, the Old Testament predicted the coming of the world Savior who would be God in human form. There are some 60 prophecies in the Old Testament. When you examine the life of Jesus, you begin to realize that He has a matchless profile. Now listen to me. I said this some weeks ago. I'm going to say it again. The odds against anybody doing what Jesus did in fulfilling all these prophecies to the letter is astronomical. There's a book written, it's entitled Science Speaks. It's written by Peter Stoner, who's a great mathematician. And he says that the likelihood of anybody fulfilling, the likelihood of any one person fulfilling throughout history, fulfilling 48 of the prophecies, would be one chance in 10 to the 157th power. Notice what he actually said. He said it would be the same as trying to find one specific predetermined atom among a trillion, 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 billion universes the size of our universe. That's about as close to impossible as you can get. For one man to fulfill just 48 of the 60 prophecies, as close to impossible as you can get. Folks, Christianity doesn't ask you to check your brain at the door. So many times people say, well, you know, to be a Christian, you can't be a reasoning person. You can't be, you can't think. You have to accept. All you, uh, all you have to do is weigh the evidence and you know that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. The evidence demands a verdict. And that verdict is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone rose from the dead. And lastly today, I want to answer the question, how is Jesus different? He is he's the answer to pluralism. He is the answer to identity questions. He gives evidence to the fact that He is God. But how is He actually different? Now, we've identified Jesus, the path to uh, the person of God. And He is God. But so what? So what? Is the belief system of Christianity real? Is it really all that different from all the rest of the religions in the world? Aren't they all just a, a, a rule, have rules of morality? Isn't that all the religion is? Well, I heard one comedian years ago say, this, he said, religions are just guilt with different holidays. That was his definition of religion. I beg to disagree with that assessment. I believe that God's plan through Jesus Christ is total opposition to all the world's religions. Without Jesus Christ or with a false belief of Jesus Christ, you have a religion and you're on your way to hell. Years ago, the question of Christian distinctiveness was raised at a conference some of the participants said, well, Christianity is different because God became man. And the other side said, well, wait a minute. Other religions also have the same doctrine that God became man. What about the resurrection? Another person asked. No, it was argued. Other faiths believe that the dead rise again. 
So the discussion became very heated. And one of the participants came in late and sat down. And they said he asked what the ruckus was all about. Everybody was fighting the back and forth. And when he learned what the debate was about and the uniqueness of Christianity, he said, oh, that's easy. The difference in Christianity is it's grace. It's grace. What does that mean? Every single, listen, every single world religion gives you something to do. Every single world religion. You have to take a pilgrimage. You have to recite a mantra. You have to kill an infidel. You have to do a good deed. These are all the ways that you get to God. Something you have to do. Every world religion gives you something to do to be acceptable to God. Christianity, though, is different than all other world religions. Christianity, you can't do anything to earn God's favor. You can't do anything. Folks, it's already been done. That's the difference. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died and paid sin's penalty for you. You see, we get His worthy life and we lose our worthless sinfulness. We get His worthy life. It's a free gift. It's a free gift that God offers through simple faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Folks, listen. This, we find here that if you had to do something to belong to a country club, that wouldn't be grace. But if you had... If you had a country club that said, you can join, you don't have to pay dues, you don't have to do anything, just accept the gift that we're offering you, that would be a real, that would be a real proud thing to have, or, or something good to be around. But that's what Christianity is like. You see, Christianity and Christians aren't being exclusive when we say that Jesus is the way to God. We're being inclusive. We're not saying that you got to be tall, short, fat, skinny, white, green, purple. We're saying that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. We're being inclusive. You know, when Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, he said in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then he went on to say, being justified. Now the word justified means being made just as if you had never sinned. He said everybody sinned, but it, to be justified freely is by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Folks, listen, Jesus Christ is the only path to God. Amen. He's the only path to God. And not only that, Jesus Christ is God. Amen. He's not a liar. He's not schizophrenic. He's everything that you want in the God that you serve. So my question is, which God is the real God? And I think the Bible tells us the answer. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Next week, I want to answer the question, if you're a good God, where did evil come from? I ran into somebody two weeks ago that asked me that question. I want to answer it for all of us to understand what the Scriptures teach. Shall we stand?